Your typical sports team doesn't really have an origin myth. They just file the paperwork and they start playing and that's that. The Minnesota Vikings, meanwhile, offer us two. The first was discovered in 1898 near Kensington, Minnesota, a little more than 100 miles northwest of Minneapolis. One day, a farmer called over his neighbors to check out an ancient-looking stone bearing strange carvings that he said he'd found on his property. A professor from the University of Minnesota identified it as a suspicious mashup of similar languages from separate eras, and although his translation implied it was left there by Swedish and Norse explorers from many centuries ago, he saw that it was very obviously a fake, and said so to anybody who would listen. The people of Kensington would not listen, and instead they chose to believe a second, more opportunistic academic who showed up and declared that the runestone was a genuine relic dating back to the year 1362. Was it all that hard to buy into? After all, it's known that Leif Erikson led his Vikings to briefly settle in Newfoundland in the year 1021, centuries before Columbus wandered into North America. Surely those Viking longships could have navigated through the Great Lakes, from the northern tip of Newfoundland to a chunk of inland Minnesota that's about as far west as Dallas. Same difference, right? In his book, Myths of the Runestone, historian David M. Kruger observes that a hoax like this one was custom engineered for a local population of Scandinavian immigrants to buy into. If their ancestors had arrived in Minnesota more than 500 years prior, it was a sign that they were quote-unquote supposed to be here, that it purged them of the guilt of occupying land that was stolen from Native Americans. We're not picking on Minnesota here because this is a much more broadly American phenomenon. To take one example of many, one fringe theory claims that the bodies of Cleopatra and Alexander the Great are buried in Illinois somewhere. This one seems downright plausible in comparison. And as late as the 1960s, when the NFL's Minnesota Vikings began play, a poll suggested that the majority of Minnesotans still bought into it. The supposed artifact is still publicly viewable today, and its official website maintains that the team owes its name to the Kensington Runestone. Today, this legend manifests in many ways, the most outrageous of which is the signature artifact of the Minnesota Vikings, the Gjallarhorn. It's pretty goofy, which is what everybody likes about it. It's a big, huge horn that overlooks the field and is sounded by a special guest or Vikings legend before every game. And here, before the 2016 home opener, the man of the hour is the central character of the Minnesota Vikings' second origin myth. This story also concerns a horn, but it's a little bit more compelling, because it's true. In November of 1940, a 13-year-old Harry Grant, who goes by Bud, is waiting with his friend in a bog on the shore of Yellow Lake, Wisconsin, some 40 miles from his home in Minnesota. They're duck hunting, but so far today they haven't had a lot of luck. All of a sudden, the wind begins to pick up. Ducks start flying all over the place. Bud shoots one with a single-shot rifle, then another, then another. He's having the time of his life. The Ducks are responding to the arrival of what will become known as the Armistice Day Blizzard of 1940. Days earlier, a low-pressure system developed in the Pacific Northwest, wreaking havoc and, among other things, causing the Tacoma Narrows Bridge to famously twist and turn and eventually crumble into the Puget Sound. This system has traveled thousands of miles eastward in recent days, and now, it's here. The resulting blizzard will claim nearly 50 lives across the state of Minnesota. Winds are swelling to an eventual top speed of 50 miles per hour, and the temperature is dipping toward the negatives at a seemingly impossible rate. By the time Bud and his friend realize they need to get back to the cabin, it's right on top of them. This is already a matter of life and death. As they stumble through the bog, Bud's friend falls waist deep into the water. It isn't long before his pants are completely frozen. He says he can't go on any further. Bud looks around and sees nothing but pure white in every direction. There's no visibility. He has no idea which direction to walk toward. But he insists, over and over, that he's not leaving his friend anywhere. They have to keep moving. Neither are dressed for these kinds of conditions. They're surely minutes from death if they can't find their way to shelter. Bud presses on, picking a direction, any direction, with no idea whether they're headed towards safety. And then he hears a horn. A train rumbles along the tracks up ahead, and although Bud can't see it, he hears it. It's all he needs. Bud follows the tracks that lead him back to the cabin. Over the ensuing days, the two stay warm by drinking vodka, crowding into a stranded car with strangers to generate body warmth, and marching miles in the snow in search of help. Bud Grant and his friend 
survive. Over the ensuing years, Grant emerges as a spectacular, multidisciplined athlete. He's drafted by the Lakers, where he emerges as a fan favorite, and alongside stars like George Mikan, he wins an NBA title. He's also drafted in the first round by the Philadelphia Eagles, so he returns to football. Soon after, he moves north and becomes an all-star in the Canadian Football League, and at just 29 years of age, he becomes the head coach of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. He leads the Bombers to two Grey Cup championships in his first three seasons. In 1961, the NFL's newly founded Minnesota Vikings come calling and offer Grant the head coaching job. Grant declines and returns to Winnipeg, where he quickly wins two more Grey Cups. In 1967, the Vikings coaching job is once again vacant, and this time, finally decides the time is right. Bud Grant did not found the Vikings. Had he never come back home, a team named the Minnesota Vikings still would have existed. He did, however, build the Vikings as we know them today. Many decades later, he writes that he never would have made it if he had not heard that horn. The NFL has existed since 1920, but it didn't really become what it is today until it started playing Super Bowls. At the beginning of this Super Bowl era in 1966, most of the 32 teams we know today were in existence, and as you'd expect, their fortunes sprouted in every direction. Here, we'll see their cumulative regular season win differential within the Super Bowl era at the end of each year. For example's sake, if your win differential is plus 10, you've won 10 more games than you've lost, and if it's negative 10, you've lost 10 more games than you've won. It gives us no pleasure to report that the Detroit Lions are the worst team of the Super Bowl era, having lost 152 more games than they've won. The other losing teams as of the end of the 2022 season, going from worst to least bad, are the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, Arizona Cardinals, Atlanta Falcons, Cleveland Browns, New York Jets, Cincinnati Bengals, Jacksonville Jaguars, New Orleans Saints, New York Giants, Houston Texans, Buffalo Bills, Chicago Bears, Tennessee Titans, Los Angeles Chargers, and Carolina Panthers. Oddly, there's a noticeable gap separating the losers from the winners here, as though the break-even line repels all teams and requires them to choose one side or the other. There's no mathematical reason for this to have happened, but it's nice for sorting purposes. The winning teams are the Washington Commanders, Seattle Seahawks, Philadelphia Eagles, Los Angeles Rams, Indianapolis Colts, Baltimore Ravens, Las Vegas Raiders, Kansas City Chiefs, Denver Broncos, San Francisco 49ers, Miami Dolphins, Green Bay Packers, New England Patriots, Minnesota Vikings. Only two teams, the Dallas Cowboys and Pittsburgh Steelers, have a better win differential than the Vikings within the Super Bowl era. In 2022, these Vikings just barely squeaked into third place following a 13-4 season, and the win that pushed them over the top was one of the most ludicrous games we have ever seen. Like most franchises, the Vikings' reputation changes from era to era and from year to year. At different points in its history, a team might find itself admired, respected, worried about, laughed at, hated, or forgotten about entirely. And entering week 15 of the 2022 season, fans across the NFL see the Vikings as fakes. Their surprising 10-3 record is believed as fraudulent, slapped together by a series of suspiciously close wins over mediocre teams. Whenever they faced a true NFC power in the form of the Cowboys or the Eagles, they've been totally blown out. So far this season, they have, by a small margin, allowed more points than they scored. How can a team with 10 wins and 3 losses be collectively outscored by its opponents? What kind of a shell game are they playing? Well, today they find the perfect opportunity to hold off these questions for just a little bit. They're at home, hosting a fairly awful Colts squad that's in a state of total disarray this season. 
This is a special Saturday afternoon time slot, and that means there won't be any other NFL games in progress, and they'll have all of America's undivided attention. Maybe they can finally pick up an easy, decisive win and cast the image of a team worth taking seriously. Well, in front of their home fans, and the entire country, the Vikings completely shit their pants. What used to be slander is now demonstrated as fact. This team's a joke. By halftime, these decidedly bad Colts are embarrassing them by a score of 33-0. to zero. Let's look at every game in NFL history in which the home team was shut out at halftime. This has happened a lot of times, and as all these green dots indicate, it's a navigable situation. You can still come back and win if the halftime deficit isn't too big. Within this sample, the largest ever comeback has been from 24 points down, though. 33 points? No comeback even remotely this large has ever been seen. In fact, being down this bad in the first place is something that's only been seen a handful of times. The Vikings are losing in every way. <laughs> They've even lost the room. As halftime strikes, the Vikings faithful, a fan base as passionate and loyal as any in the NFL, aggressively boos them into the locker room. Hard to blame him. Not so joyous here. As for what we know based on 103 years worth of prior NFL history, this game is over. The Vikings do get to start the second half with the ball, where the first steps of their thousand mile journey are three plays that combine to produce negative eight yards. Punt. Exactly how they drew it up. Halfs off to a rollicking start. Their next series, they are able to put together an 88-yard drive that ends with a short touchdown that at least gets them on the board. The Colts respond with a long field goal that bumps their lead to 29, but the Vikings have found their footing offensively and march 75 yards to punch in another touchdown with a minute and change left in the third. When Minnesota's defense forces a three and out, they're able to quickly get the ball back, giving them a chance to tack on a third TD when Colts corner Stephon Gilmore bites hard on an inside move just two minutes into the fourth quarter. That's a fun and cute scoring onslaught, but their hole was so deep they're still in terrible shape kicking off down 15 points. And they're in even worse shape after their next possession midway through the quarter when an ill-advised deep pass is easily intercepted. But Indy's continued inability to milk the clock gives the Vikes a glimmer of hope. Getting the ball back with 7 minutes left, it only takes about 90 seconds for them to cut through the Colts' Swiss cheese defense and set up a 1-yard touchdown pass to make it a 1-score game with plenty of time remaining. Indy finally is able to grind out some yardage, keep the clock running, and move the chains. And right when they're on the verge of delivering the knockout punch, they give the ball away. This time, however, Minnesota can't capitalize, and a turnover on downs deals a brutal blow to any thoughts of a miracle comeback especially with the Colts getting ready to run a fourth and inches play, where, with the Vikings out of timeouts, a conversion will ice the game. But Indy's offensive line is unable to generate any push on a quarterback sneak, giving Minnesota a pulse. Needing to go 64 yards in two and a half minutes, they don't exactly need that much time. Their first play is a quick screen that Colt safety Rodney McLeod could easily bring to an end after a gain of about 10 yards, but instead takes a horrible angle and gets caught flat-footed. Toss in another one, two, three missed tackles, and we're a two-point conversion away from a tie game, which the Vikes do indeed bank to ultimately, against all odds, send the game to overtime. In the extra frame, the teams trade punts, making a tie a very strong possibility as Minnesota sits on the outskirts of field goal range with 20 seconds left. But they're able to move the ball 13 more yards, get an additional five thanks to a defensive penalty, and boot home the game-winning kick to complete the record-breaking comeback. And the kick is good. It's, good. it's a winner!
Thanks to this win, a win the likes of which we have never seen before and might never see again, the Minnesota Vikings now stand 108 games above 500, beating out the New England Patriots by just one win to finish on the podium at third place in the Super Bowl era. That's no small feat considering the Patriots had spent nearly the entire 21st century building the greatest NFL dynasty ever seen. Of course, that came on the heels of three decades of largely underwhelming football. The Vikings are unique in that they've never really had a long, protracted slide. Even the Cowboys, the winningest team, have seen their share of lean years. They most closely resemble the dependable Steelers, although even they took quite a few years to get going. So, the Minnesota Vikings, who are these people? We have a very long answer for you, and that answer might be a little bit different from the one you'd get from Vikings fans, which neither Alex nor myself are. That's why, for instance, you'll hear more about Brock Lesnar than you will about Bill Brown. We'll talk more about Prince than we will Ron Yeri. A completionist history would take about 50 hours. We're going to see how many we can fit into about seven. To fully appreciate who these Vikings became, we should first understand who they were to begin with. We're going to move now to their prehistoric era, before the arrival of Bud Grant and before the first Super Bowl was ever played. But while most franchises take several years to produce an identity or even any signs of life at all, these Vikings needed about 15 minutes. Now, Some of these ancient games, including this one, lack a full play-by-play -play record, leaving us to rely on scattered footage and newspaper reports to read the runes as best we can. Its brilliance shines through anyway. For their maiden voyage, the Minnesota Vikings welcomed to Metropolitan Stadium the Chicago Bears, and no franchise has ever been as synonymous with one person as the Chicago Bears with George Papa Bear Hallis. The man on the opposite sideline also founded the team 42 years earlier as one of the league's charter members, and ever since then he's owned them made every football and personnel decision, made every business decision, and is in his 34th season calling the shots as their head coach, the first nine of which he doubled as a player lining up at both wideout and defensive end. Other than that, he's pretty hands off. And ironically enough, the very existence of these Minnesota Vikings is due in large part to the relentless efforts of Papa Bear. Initially, a new Minneapolis team was slated to become an original franchise with the upstart American Football League beginning play in 1960. But then they began sniffing around the established, prestigious National Football League to try and gain membership there instead, though the bar was set high. They didn't quite reach it, but it was an issue firmly on Hallis's radar. The prospective ownership group tried to put out that fire and said they remained committed to the AFL, but a few weeks later, with the constant looming threat of a competing NFL team eventually emerging in the same market, the union between Minneapolis and the budding AFL disintegrated. Now all eyes shifted toward a potential union with the NFL. There was still the issue of needing to secure unanimity while one of the league's owners was an incredibly stubborn pain in the ass. But Hallis was steadfast in his desire for expansion, and so he orchestrated an effort to change the NFL's constitution so that one asshole couldn't undermine everyone. His efforts were successful, and boom, from there, the Minnesota Vikings were born. and Hallis's Bears are now set to compete against that which he helped bring to life in their first game. It doesn't take very long until he perhaps wishes he hadn't. The Vikings have little trouble advancing deep into Chicago territory on all three of their first quarter drives, though they only combine to produce three points. Their first ever touchdown comes early in the second when rookie quarterback Fran Tarkenton, who's come off the bench to replace starter George Shaw and show what he's got, threads the needle to take a 10-0 lead. Early in the second half, after Chicago's cut their deficit to just four, he lofts a deep gem right on Jerry Reichow for touchdown number two, officially opening the floodgates. He's later able to squeeze a pass through double coverage to Reichow that moves him down to the Bears' one. When three runs go nowhere, the Vikes turn to Tark, who looks to the flat for his third touchdown pass to give his team an 18-point lead in their inaugural game. 
Tarkenton will also first introduce to the people of Minnesota his penchant for scrambling behind the line of scrimmage to buy time and find an open receiver, and he'll show his legs can be used on designed runs too as he plunges into the end zone. Desperate to get something going near the end of the game, the Bears are picked off by Minnesota's Jack Morris, giving another chance for Fran to continue his incredible debut and flash some more sizzle for the crowd. Some more scrambling produces yet another big play downfield, and on another fourth down near the goal line, Tarkenton takes matters into his own hands, unleashing a bullet to the back of the end zone to give the Vikings a stunning 31 point lead. Chicago will tack on a garbage time touchdown, but that's just lipstick on a pig. This annihilation stings Papa Bear bad. All his hard work to grant the Minneapolis region an NFL team, and this is the thanks he gets? The biggest humiliation of his career. The guy did not want to be this helpful. Comparisons between the Minnesota Vikings and the actual historical Norse Vikings tend to be pretty tortured and obnoxious, but there are a few occasions where we just won't be able to help ourselves, this is one of those. The most feared Viking warriors were known as Berserkers. The story goes that Berserker translates to bear shirt, uh, alluding to the warriors' practice of wearing the skins of bears they slaughtered. That might be ahistorical, but listen, myth is going to be a very important word going forward. Anyway. It does add up. Although the Bears were arguably the most prestigious team of the old NFL, the Vikings have completely transcended them in the modern era. Entering the 2023 season, the difference is greater than it's ever been. This would have been unthinkable to Chicago if their reaction to being blown out in this game is any indication, with their dignified elder statesman delivering what has to be the shortest post-game speech in NFL history. Language George the biggest reason why the Vikings didn't just win, but blew the Bears out of the water was because of the precocious play of their 21-year-old rookie with a unique style and approach to playing the position. Having seen the spark provided by his scrambling, Minnesota was learning to embrace their young quarterback's flair for improvisation. Tarkenton, a native of Athens, Georgia, originally developed this skill while attending the University of Georgia in the 1950s. As he explains it, in those days it was frowned on for a quarterback to display any mobility whatsoever. Bailing on a crowded pocket was unacceptable, and quarterbacks just had to accept the physical pounding of getting clobbered over and over again by much larger human beings, especially in Fran's case. While he acknowledges he broke the barrier in this regard, he also later points out that it's not something he wanted to do, but rather something that he needed to do. It was essential for him to minimize the big hits his slender frame absorbed in order to have a lengthy career not curtailed by injuries. And it worked. Not only did his legs help him stay remarkably durable, but as he showed from day one, he was also able to effectively keep the ball and gain yardage on the ground. This is not a dynamic scene from quarterbacks around football during his early years in the league. Six seasons into his career, Tark's already managed to pick up nearly 2,000 yards on the ground. When that rushing productivity is combined with an arm that was able to rack up the fourth most passing yards in this time, the Minnesota Vikings are clearly employing a one-of-a-kind threat at the most important position in sports. Tarkenton's scrambling allowed him to accomplish four things. As Alex said, it allowed him to escape mortal danger, and it allowed him to pick up yards on the ground. In this play against the Rams in 1963, Tarkenton demonstrates the other two. His pocket is collapsed, and the Rams Deacon Jones and Merlin Olsen, both future Hall of Famers, are right on top of him. Most quarterbacks at this point in history would either go down with a ship or hurry a throw and risk an interception. Instead, Tarkenton makes him work for it. Defensive ends around the league, who are often about 80 pounds heavier than Tarkenton, hate him for this. In fact, decades later, Olsen will say, that little wimp would run around out there for hours and hours and hours, and we had to chase him wherever he went. I'm willing to bet this is the exact play Olsen was thinking of. Guys like him simply aren't conditioned for long chases like this one. When he makes them do this all afternoon, the fatigue really adds up. He wears them out. And here's the fourth accomplishment. Tarkenton can keep him guessing by looking like he's about to tuck and run one moment and then clutch and look downfield for an open receiver the next. Deacon Jones is one of the few who are athletic enough to keep after him here. You would assume Jones forces the issue at this point, but Tarkenton's greedy. 
He just needs to buy two more seconds, and he gets him with a Looney Tunes series of zigs and zags sending Jones spinning out. Finally, after about 12 seconds, he likes what he sees. He stops, plants his back foot, and launches a 50-yard bomb that goes for six. Tarkenton needed all 12 of those seconds to make that happen. That stunning franchise opening win isn't diminished at all by the games and years that follow. The Vikings do regress to what they're basically supposed to be, finishing this year with a 3-11 record, and within this prehistoric record that stretches to 1966, they only register one winning season. Very typical stuff for a new sports franchise. But at the same time, I can't help but wonder how much better they might have been had they been able to lay off the booze just a little bit. <laughs> we have three stories to tell here. Before we do, an important disclaimer for any young folks who may be in the audience, do not do any of the things you are about to hear. They are all bad and stupid. They will not make you cool, and if you do them, the best case scenario is that you will have the very worst time of your entire life. First, defensive end Don Joyce, one of their many past their prime castaways who found their way onto the Vikings roster in 1961. During training camp, bartenders independently testified that the 250-pound Joyce drinks 75 bottles of beer in a 24-hour span. 75 12-ounce bottles. Not even counting the glass bottles, strictly the beer itself, that is 56 pounds of beer. To do this, one would have to clock in at 9am, open a beer, and finish it within 12 minutes, which is pretty quick, then one finishes another one in 12 minutes, and so on and so forth, until one has finished five beers in an hour. That would make me pretty sick, personally. Then one keeps finishing one beer every 12 minutes, hour after hour after hour, all the way until midnight. Next, wide receiver Paul Flatley. In 1965, the morning before a game in San Fran, Flatley's hotel roommate wakes up and discovers his bed empty. After some searching, they find Flatley stumbling around wasted in the lobby. Instead of sleeping, he'd spent all night in the hotel bar. He's just a mess. His hands are shaking and everything. But he still plays, facing the threat of a thousand dollar fine if he doesn't. Flatley not only plays, but plays the game of his life. He ends up with two touchdowns and 202 receiving yards. In the decades to follow, the Vikings will see an absolutely jaw-dropping amount of receiving talent walk in their doors, and yet this performance from Flatley ties for fourth best in franchise history through 2022. Finally, I'd like to share a riddle with you. A man goes to sleep downstairs, and when he wakes up, he's upstairs. Nobody carried him. How can this be? The Minnesota Sheraton Ritz Hotel has a bar, and the bar advertises a very stupid gimmick called a yard of ale. It's a special three foot tall glass full of beer, so yes, it is literally a yard of ale. The least unreasonable way to consume this would be to drink it with a straw, but you know it's not gonna be that easy. You're expected to lift the glass and drink it as you would a normal glass. Imagine how unwieldy that would be, how impossible it would be just to take a normal sized drink. As it tilts, the whole thing's coming down the pipe all at once. One night, tight end and linebacker Steve Stonebreaker modifies this into the dumbest, most disgusting cocktail of all time. Instead of beer, Stonebreaker orders this vessel to be filled all the way with martini. The bartender says no, but eventually relents after Stonebreaker insists, reportedly throwing in dozens of olives. Obviously, and thankfully, Stonebreaker doesn't get the whole way through it. After some time, he stumbles off into the lobby like he's Tarkinson in the backfield, falls down, and passes out at the foot of a moving escalator. It's reported that the escalator dutifully ushers him upward and gracefully drops the sleeping man off on the second floor. The ringleader of this circus is a man who some of you may remember. Norm Van Brocklin, nicknamed the Dutchman, will later go on to be a mercurial and largely ineffective head coach for the Atlanta Falcons. For now, he's a mercurial and largely ineffective head coach for the Minnesota Vikings. When he takes the job in January of 1961, he's only weeks removed from winning the NFL championship as a quarterback with the Eagles. He retired as one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time, one who once threw for 554 yards in a single game, a record that still stands 71 years later. 
Oddly though, not an ounce of his poise in the pocket is carried over into his new profession. One story in particular perfectly captures Van Brocklin's coaching tenure. It was recalled by Jim Klobuchar, the iconic Minnesota sports writer who served as a source of many of these wild stories from the early days. He knew and understood this team to an intimate degree that's never really seen in sports writing today, often getting scoops on the craziest stories, whether in a hotel lobby or stranded in a blizzard, not because he had an impressive network of sources, but because he himself was actually there. And since you may be wondering, yep, Jim Klobuchar was in fact the father of future senator and presidential candidate Amy Klobuchar. Jim Klobuchar had so many arguments with Van Brocklin that it's hard to keep them all straight, but during one of them, Van Brocklin challenges him to a fistfight. Klobuchar refuses, Van Brocklin insists, and he even offers up his hotel room as a venue. Finally, Klobuchar agrees to fight, but at some point during what must have been a very weird elevator ride, Van Brocklin's enthusiasm for kicking Klobuchar's ass seems to have dissipated. Klobuchar describes the brawl as a half-hearted, awkward grappling match that ends with them falling down and breaking the hotel room TV. That was Norm Van Brocklin. He'd be one guy one moment and a completely different guy the next. His anger radiated omnidirectionally. If you caught it, it wasn't because you deserved it, it wasn't born out of some tactic to motivate you, it was because you were standing there. Like any other person, Van Brocklin was multifaceted and complicated. In his personal life, for instance, he and his wife once adopted three kids in the neighborhood who'd lost their parents because he couldn't bear the thought of them growing up without a normal life. There was good in Norm Van Brocklin, the man. It's just that Coach Norm Van Brocklin was impossible to please for any length of time. His tenure was made up of an endless series of rash decisions, the most notable of which comes after a 41-21 loss to the Colts in 1965. The next morning, to the shock of the entire organization, Van Brocklin quits. He doesn't bother to tell anybody beforehand, he just calls reporters to his office and does it. Not only does he quit, he emphasizes multiple times that there's no talking him out of it. He is done with football forever and he is never ever coming back 12 hours later he comes back. Vikings management had begged him to return, but they shouldn't have bothered. It's all over. Van Brocklin has lost credibility with his players, and their playoff hopes are about to fall off a cliff. And although Tarkenton says all the right things in the papers, he privately wishes he would have stayed gone. The rift between coach and quarterback had been growing for a few years. The popular explanation was that Tarkenton's incessant scrambling in the backfield infuriated Van Brocklin, and it sometimes seemed to, but... Like everything else with this guy, it just depended on the hour or day you talk to him. The real problem is that Tarkenton just can't stand his teammates being routinely disrespected, insulted, and bullied by Van Brocklin. He bristles at what he perceives as Van Brocklin's need to be the star of the show, to have the universe revolve around him just like it did when he was a star quarterback. Remarkably, Tarkenton, the much younger man, has displayed far more maturity than Van Brocklin ever has. He knows who he is, what he can control, and what he can't, and it's around this time that he gives up on putting up with Norm's bullshit for the sake of making it work. In the 1966 season, the first of the Super Bowl era, things get worse. Van Brocklin's words ring more and more hollow among the players. Toward the end of the season, the Vikings play the brand new Atlanta Falcons for the first time ever. Although the game's in Minnesota, the game is going to be broadcast in Tarkenton's native Georgia. It's a big deal for him. Van Brocklin decides to bench his franchise quarterback in favor of Bob Barry, who's never started an NFL game. In rough weather, Barry struggles throughout, throwing five interceptions as the Vikings lose by just one touchdown. On the other side, Falcons players can't believe it. They were sure Van Brocklin would send in Tarkenton late, since the game was still winnable, but he never showed up except to hold the ball on extra points and field goals. One Falcons player goes so far as to rip Van Brocklin for his stubbornness. And while Tarkenton once again remains diplomatic and professional in the moment, he later describes it as a power play, a message that this was the Dutchman show. And that is how Van Brocklin blew it. The greatest quarterback of the 1960s and 70s fell into his lap and began producing from day one. A revolutionary, a future Hall of Famer, a player who, as of 2023, still holds the Vikings record for most passing yards by a huge margin. All gone to waste because Van Brocklin was incapable of getting over himself. Two months later, in the offseason, Tarkenton asked Van Brocklin to trade him. We should be used to this by now. All of a sudden, Van Brocklin values his quarterback again. In a six-hour conversation, he tries to talk Tarkenton into sticking around, but it's no use. 
The situation has taken a chunk out of both of them. They're exhausted. A day after Tarkenton submits his trade request to the front office, Van Brocklin submits his resignation as head coach. Tarkenton could have rescinded the request after Van Brocklin left, but he didn't. Van Brocklin could have traded Tarkenton and moved on with a new quarterback like it seemed like he wanted to, but he didn't. When the confrontation finally happened, neither Tarkenton nor the Dutchman won. Neither even wanted to win. They just wanted it to be over. The greatest quarterback in Minnesota Vikings history is already gone. This marks the end of prehistory. Welcome to the beginning of the modern NFL. Everything resets to zero. All previous successes and failures of all 24 teams in existence are knocked off the board. Congratulations to the Green Bay Packers, winners of Super Bowl I. The Super Bowl era is now underway. This is the birth of the NFL as we know it now, and with it, we also see the beginnings of the Minnesota Vikings we now know them to be. Bud Grant, who headed south from Winnipeg to succeed Norm Van Brocklin as head coach prior to the 1967 season, loves the American flag. So much that he made his players practice lining up to face the flag for the national anthem, exactly like this, toes on the sideline and helmets tucked into their right arms. Grant himself is very patriotic, but he's not trying to force his ideology on anyone. He says it often. You don't have to love America, and if you think this is silly bullshit, that is fine but it's what we're doing. In the wake of Van Brocklin's tenure, which was authoritarianism one moment and anarchy the next, there simply had to be some rules here, if only for the sake of having rules. His players do find a lot of this stuff really funny, but they buy into it, just as they buy into the other ostensibly trivial little things Grand Institutes. They all jog onto the practice field at the same time, they all wear their socks the same way, etc. Countless football coaches have tried similar stuff and been laughed out of their own locker rooms, but not Bud Grant. This was a coach who earned respect without even needing to try. He was authentic, genuine, the real deal, and the most quietly confident and self-assured coach who has ever paced an NFL sideline. There has never been another coach like Bud Grant. Not then, not now. Although he'll fill these Vikings teams with Muslim players and evangelical Christians alike, he'll never lead them in team prayer because he doesn't believe in God. Like most other things, he doesn't really make a big deal about this, but the mere fact that he even says so sets him apart from any other football coach you've ever heard of. Another quality that sets him apart, he does not believe in bulletin boards. He has no use for slogans. The only line he ever repeats in the press is, well, it seemed like the thing to do. This is a piece of brilliant engineering on Bud's part because it's impervious to annoying follow-up questions. Hey Bud, how come you always say it seemed like the thing to do? Oh, I don't know. It just seemed like the thing to do. See? Even in the privacy of the locker room, Grant never gives rousing speeches. In fact, he usually doesn't give any speeches at all. Not before a big game, not at halftime when they're losing by two or three touchdowns. This is because he sees his players not as subservient foot soldiers, but as grown men, as his peers and collaborators. He trusts them to motivate themselves and has no interest in wasting their time. This was a lesson he took from his days with the Lakers. NBA schedules were long and grueling, and he found that it didn't really take long for the same words to start ringing hollow. Coming from that same place of respect, Grant never yells at his players, ever. He's always direct, but never scathing or malicious. We can often speak in absolutes about Bud Grant because no circumstances ever seem to change him. Jim Klobuchar calls him, quote, sanity's fixed beacon at Metropolitan Stadium, an emotional Sahara, and they love him for that. Bud's rules, by the way, do have a little bit of give. He's a realist. A lot of his players love to smoke, and while he personally despises smoking, he offers up a compromise. You can smoke if the walls are at least 12 feet high. 
On road trips, players always make sure to pack their tape measures. Congratulations once again to the Green Bay Packers, winners of Super Bowl II. Hopefully for the Vikings, some other team is eventually allowed to win a Super Bowl because the Vikings are actually starting to look like a candidate. In 1968, Bud Grant's second season in Minnesota, they finally pushed themselves over the hump and into the playoffs with an 8-6 record. The Vikings should get comfortable because they're going to practically live out here. Within the first 57 years of the Super Bowl era, they'll play a total of 52 playoff games, more than the vast majority of NFL franchises. And this is number one. And on play number one in Baltimore's muddy Memorial Stadium against the Colts, they break through and sack league MVP Earl Morrill for an eight yard loss. The tone is immediately set that their defense has come to play, but that unit is ultimately undone by two excruciating Baltimore big plays. One is this downfield bomb where Willie Richardson has negative separation but still somehow comes down with the ball to set up a short touchdown a couple plays later. The other is on a pass down the seam to tight end John Mackey that Vikes linebacker Roy Winston comes agonizingly close to picking off, only for Mackey to secure while staying upright despite both safeties converging on him and taking it all the way to pay dirt for the 14-0 Colts lead. Huge daggers when there were defenders who couldn't have been in better position. Then on second and eight, the Colts decide to send half of Maryland after quarterback Joe Cap. Cap doesn't stand a chance. He's obliterated from every direction and coughs up the ball right into the waiting arms of linebacker Mike Curtis who takes it the other way to blow the game wide open. Minnesota scores their first ever postseason touchdown late when everyone's covered in mud from head to toe. First on Cap's one yard pass to Billy Martin with eight minutes left and then a seven yarder to Bill Brown with just seconds left. It just was too little, too late, as the Vikings fall by 10. Congratulations to the New York Jets, winners of Super Bowl III. Now, what we have here is a three-axis chart, right? The x-axis represents the year, and the y represents the franchise's cumulative games above or below 500. This is a good time to talk about the Z. The z-axis represents how long each franchise has been waiting for a Super Bowl win. The higher a team is, the more years it's waited. That's why, for instance, the Packers are down here while everybody else is up there. They just won it last season, so they've only been waiting for one year. Now, here we'll go ahead and allow ourselves to peek into the future for just a moment so we can see just how long a team can be made to wait. The Jets just won the big one, of course, but now the clock starts over. They're going to have to wait one, two, three, four, five years. And then they'll keep on waiting through the 70s, and then... Well, listen, Jets fans, I'm talking to you from far, far into the future, and my advice to you is that you make sure to really, really, really enjoy this one, all right? Really enjoy it. Now, on to the 1969 season. Let's see how the Vikings are doing. Holy smokes! 12-2. and two. Best record in the NFL. Welcome to the Bud Grant experience. As any fan of good defense knows, everything starts up front, and boy are the 69 Vikes blessed with an embarrassment of riches along their defensive line. Nicknamed the Purple People Eaters, they relentlessly harass opposing quarterbacks off the edge. One of their starting ends is speedster Jim Marshall, for whom they traded just a few days before their 1961 franchise debut after a bout with encephalitis through his status with the Browns in limbo. There was no longer room in Cleveland for him at his natural position, and after an unsuccessful attempt to convert him to offense, the Vikings were the beneficiaries of the Browns' blunder. Marshall entered their starting lineup from day one, wreaking havoc all game in that blowout win over Chicago, and for the next 19 years, the Minnesota Vikings will never play a single game without Marshall in their starting lineup, making life miserable for left tackles. The end opposite Marshall, the man who makes life miserable for right tackles, is Carl Eller. 
Lucky that he was still on the board, the Vikings chose the local product out of Minnesota 6th overall in the 1964 draft, and even Papa Bear knew immediately the headaches pairing another star defensive end with Marshall would cause. And now, in 1969, the future Hall of Famer is right in the heart of his prime. With those two screaming upfield off the edge, if quarterbacks dare seek asylum by stepping up in the pocket, well, that would just mean being engulfed by Alan Page, a devastating interior disruptor who will also go on to make the Hall of Fame, which for him as a Canton native carries extra significance. To say nothing of the fact that, remarkably enough, he actually helped physically build the dang thing. As you'd imagine, these guys are perennial all pros, and 1969 marks the second straight season that entire trio of defensive linemen all earned such an accolade. Speaking of that trio's ability to get after the passer, their freedom to do so is thanks to the man rounding out the group, lining up beside Page at defensive tackle, Gary Larson. Serving as the unit's policeman, his focus is on shutting down the opponent's ground game and all the dirty work that unlocks the pass-rushing explosiveness of his fellow Purple People Eaters. Not that quarterbacks were safe from his clutches either, as we can see by taking a look at the NFL sack leaders from 1969. While not officially recorded for individuals until 1982, we do have some unofficial numbers from this season, thanks to the wonderful pro football reference. Eller and Marshall constitute two of the three players with at least 14 sacks, with Page and even Larson among the league leaders. This means they basically never need to blitz, and are afforded the luxury of leaving seven men in coverage. Headlining those seven is safety slash center fielder Paul Krause. And the latter is not just a descriptor of his ball-hawking ways in football. In college at Iowa, it was literally the position he played on the baseball team as a big league caliber player who once threw four guys out at home in a single game. He played both ways for their football team, on offense leading the Big Ten in touchdown receptions. Even in the pros, he once hung around after practice to catch some passes, and after breezing through some easy tosses, the quarterbacks actually tried to have him drop their passes. He was simply unable. As a high school basketball player, he set a county record with 54 points in a game and was an All-American in track. There was nothing Kraus didn't excel at. And oh yeah, as for his day job, he led the league in interceptions as a rookie and notched 28 total through just four career seasons in Washington. Then Minnesota swung a deal for him the prior year in 68, with the man himself probably the last to know about it before embarking on a dozen year tenure in the Twin Cities that sees him eventually enshrined in the Hall of Fame as, to this day, the league's all-time career interceptions leader. By the time the 1969 regular season wrapped up, the numbers show this was a defense that eviscerated all challengers, especially following the opener. After allowing 24 points in a one-point loss to old friend Fran Tarkenton and the New York Giants, the Vikings didn't allow more than even 14 points the rest of the way. They also had six of the season's 16 best games in terms of yards allowed per play, you just couldn't move the ball on them. They remain one of only two teams in the Super Bowl era to ever allow as few as 9.5 points per game, and we can see this year they didn't even have a peer. Bud Grant's defense was in a league of its own, and the other side of the ball wasn't exactly chopped liver either. They managed to combine that impenetrable defense with an offense that led the league in scoring. Entering the 69 postseason, this is looking to be an indestructible football juggernaut. But in their first ever home playoff game, the Vikings find themselves down 10 at halftime after they've already allowed 17 points to a sharp Rams offense behind a couple passing touchdowns from NFL MVP Roman Gabriel. In the second half though, the team from Los Angeles finds the sledding in the freezing Minnesota winter much tougher. Even staying upright while dropping back to pass becomes a struggle. 
Meanwhile, Joe Cap and the Vikes offense begin to heat up as he and star wideout Gene Washington connect on a deep 41-yard shot to set up a touchdown that pulls them within three. A Rams field goal early in the fourth quarter pushes their lead to six before Cap's able to immediately lead his team downfield with his arm. His legs move him just outside the goal line where they then finish off the job, launching Minnesota in front by reaching a gear that even he doesn't realize he possesses. Down by just one with eight minutes left, the Rams are very much alive, but Carl Eller smells blood. On the very first play in which the Vikes hold the lead, Eller extends it by soundly beating outstanding tackle Bob Brown, then eluding his blatant, futile attempt to tackle him, then dropping Gabriel for a safety. Still only needing a field goal to force overtime, the Rams are threatening to get at least that much as they march into Viking territory with less than a minute to go in regulation. That's when Alan Page has had just about enough, recognizes exactly what's coming, and steps into the passing window to intercept the ball and clinch the first playoff win in Minnesota Vikings history. The day after the Vikings' historic win, their first playoff win in the history of the franchise, the Browns and Cowboys play to determine Minnesota's next opponent. Bud Grant catches bits and pieces of it on TV, but he has better things to do. He spends most of the game shoveling his driveway. And you know why? Because it's his day off, that's why. Bud has a very strong work ethic, but once it's time to stop working, it is time to stop working. He clocks out every day before dinner time so he can go home to his wife and kids. He starts training camp as late as possible because training camp is boring. Again, this man is unlike any other football coach you have ever heard of. Anyway, I wonder whether this afternoon in the Grant family driveway is the moment he experiences his epiphany. During yesterday's game in sub-20 temperatures, the Vikings had enjoyed the comfort of sideline heaters, a pretty standard fixture around the NFL. From his upbringing in Minnesota, to his near-death experience at Yellow Lake, to his years in Winnipeg, he's known the cold intimately his entire life. Perhaps inspired by the old Norse peoples who lived and adventured in climates others found inhospitable, it's here that Bud Grant introduces a powerful new Viking myth. Grant decides that during the championship game, the final game before the Super Bowl, the Vikings will not make heaters available on the sidelines. As the home team, they'll serve as accommodating hosts and allow the Browns to do so, but the Vikings themselves will be content to freeze their asses off in 8 degree temperatures. No long johns, no hand warmers, short sleeves. In the years to come, he expounds upon this idea. It's a tactic of intimidation, sure but it's also a means of keeping his players invested. Instead of huddling around the heaters and taking themselves away from the game, they'll be standing at the sideline and watching it. This might sound like a silly gimmick, but the thing about Bud Grant's ideas is that they tend to work. The next Sunday at Metropolitan Stadium, which Vikings fans affectionately call the Met, the referees find out that it's literally too cold for their whistles, which won't stop freezing up. It's too cold for the computerized scoreboard system, which has decided to stop working. I mean, hell, given all the second half footage we're missing, it might have been too cold for cameras. In these conditions, the Vikings completely run over the Browns in a 27-7 win that was never in any doubt. As expected, the Purple People Eaters punished Cleveland all day, but this was the game in which America got to know how special and how unusual Minnesota's quarterback really was. Joe Cap. Perhaps the NFL's first great Mexican-American player took over as the Vikings starting quarterback in 1967 after Bud Grant orchestrated a very weird CFL-NFL trade to bring him south of the border. It was in the CFL that Cap earned the nickname El Seed. Have you ever seen the movie El Seed? No? Uh, have you seen the movie Weekend at Bernie's? Great, you're halfway there. The medieval Spanish knight El Seed, played by Charlton Heston, is mortally wounded in battle. His dying wish is to ride with his army in the next day's battle, but he's dead, so they make this happen for him by cobbling together this contraption that's going to allow his dead body to sit completely upright on the horse. They keep his eyes open and everything, looking good, my man. The opposing army, who was certain they'd killed him, is stricken with horror upon seeing him on his horse and decisively routed. Hey, uh, hey, hey guys, 
Guys, I think somebody should probably go get him. Anyway, that's why Joe Cap's teammates called him El Cid. Without fail, he would always lead his team into battle, despite regularly suffering every type of injury you can think of. He'd just strap himself back together and make it work. Cap played quarterback like a total weirdo. The consensus was that, at his best, he could do it all right, while also looking like he was doing it all wrong. He could pass effectively, but his throws often wobbled like wounded ducks. He sometimes just make shit up, stuff other quarterbacks never did, like this hilarious chess pass against Baltimore. But it landed in the receiver's hands. That was always the funniest part. It worked. In today's game against the Browns, though, Cap demonstrated his signature quality. Like Tarkenton before him, Cap loved to scramble, but while Tarkenton did so out of self-preservation, Cap ran as though he didn't believe in the concept of the self to begin with. Here in the third quarter, he cuts loose and finds pro bowler Big Jim Houston in his way. Quarterbacks who are not Joe Cap would either cut to the sideline, slide, or at least protect himself somehow. Cap throws his body right into Houston so hard that the much larger defender is knocked out cold. It wasn't malicious, it was just the only way Cap knew how to do it. That was these Vikings, in fact. Bud Grant and his squad weren't actually bloodthirsty berserkers. They were just the unbreakable people of the North. And on this Sunday, they began to embrace their ability to dominate in the cold as a superpower. It's a superpower that they will have to abandon immediately. Nearly every Super Bowl ever played will be held either indoors or in a warm weather climate. The Vikings, having just punched their ticket to Super Bowl IV, are headed to New Orleans, where they'll encounter the AFL champion Kansas City Chiefs. Despite coming out of the cold, the Vikings command plenty of fear and respect from all over the country. Vegas makes them a 13-point favorite over Kansas City, which speaks not only to Minnesota's performance this season, but to the perception that the NFL is inherently superior to the AFL. Despite the fact that the two are about to fully merge into a single entity, there's plenty of bad blood between these two. The AFL actually managed to sucker punch the NFL in last year's Super Bowl with the Jets coming out of nowhere. And with this being the last ever official clash between the two leagues, those in the NFL are determined to see the Vikings put the junior AFL in their place once and for all. Grant knows the entire legacy of the old NFL rests on their shoulders. Despite the Vikings entering as enormous favorites, they come out relatively flat. Shortly into the second quarter, they've punted to cap each of their two possessions while allowing Jan Stenerud field goals on each of Kansas City's first two. On their third series, Joe Cap's able to connect with John Henderson for 16 yards, only for Henderson to fumble the ball away. Minnesota's defense limits the damage, however, as two plays later, Chiefs quarterback Len Dawson goes for it all on a shot to top wideout Otis Taylor, but the Vikes have him perfectly bracketed and Paul Krause comes away with the pick. After yet another Minnesota punt and Stenerud field goal, the two-score favorites find themselves down two scores and the avalanche snowballs on the ensuing kickoff when they flub the return and watch Kansas City jump on the live ball to steal a possession that they'll start in the red zone. Dawson leads them down to the five, where on third and goal, Chiefs coach Hank Stram calls an inside trap play they haven't even practiced all postseason. 65 toss power trap to be specific. Alan Page gets caught cheating a bit to the outside, allowing polling guard Mo Mormon to easily take him out of the play. That clears a cavernous hole for running back Mike Garrett to scoot in the end zone as the Vikings fall behind 16 zip at the half. The Vikings open the second half with a defensive stop, then Cap crisply marches Minnesota down the field to set up Dave Osborne's four yard off tackle run that sneaks across the goal line to breathe life into his team with 20 minutes remaining. But on the very next drive, Otis Taylor sucks that life out real quick. 
He takes a short pass from Dawson, is able to break the tackle attempt of Vikings cornerback Ursel McBee, who's limited by a pinched nerve in his shoulder, and sprints up the sideline with safety Carl Kosolke, the only impediment between Taylor and a back-breaking touchdown. Kosulki throws himself at Taylor in a desperate effort to prevent it, but he's ultimately just a speed bump as the Chiefs take the commanding 23-7 lead near the end of the third quarter. Minnesota will get the ball three more times, but now in predictable, frantic catch-up mode, all three end with interceptions. The final one thrown by backup Gary Quazzo after a severely beaten up Joe Cap finally had to depart with a torn up shoulder. After a season of almost non-stop domination, the Vikings couldn't stop shooting themselves in the foot when it mattered most, and now they must start all over from the very bottom to try to once again scale the mountain to Super Bowl glory. Congratulations to the Kansas City Chiefs, winners of Super Bowl IV. This is their first Super Bowl win. 1969 was just one of many fascinating chapters within the amazing life of Joe Cab, who has many more adventures ahead of him, but he would never play for the Vikings again. Weeks prior to Super Bowl IV, Cap was presented with the Most Valuable Viking Award, but he refused to accept it. There is no Most Valuable Viking, he said. There are 40. Meanwhile, Bud Grant won the AP's Coach of the Year Award, surprising nobody. In just three seasons, Coach Grant has elevated these Vikings from directionless expansion franchise to Super Bowl contender. They will be back. When the Vikings beat the Browns to advance to the Super Bowl, Fran Tarkenton was watching from far away, probably his home in Georgia. Having fostered the franchise through its early lean years, he just barely missed the Bud Grant era by a matter of months. In New York, he was personally excelling, putting up monster numbers, but he was unable to reach the playoffs with a chronically average Giants team. And as he watched the Vikings clinch their Super Bowl appearance, Fran broke down in tears. He was overjoyed to see his dear old friends had finally made it, and haunted by the question of whether he would ever make it there himself. <laughs> 